Good evening and welcome to the Digital Bible Study at Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chuck and tonight we're going to be talking about Philippians chapter 3. Uh, and this is where we get into probably one of my favorite passages in the book of Philippians. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. Uh, Paul's going to talk about his pedigree and just why he has the right to boast uh, in his own work, and yet he doesn't anyways. And so it just gives us a really clear example of how we should relate to Christ. And so um, just a wonderful passage, one of my favorite in the whole book. And so we're going to be looking at Philippians 3, 1 through 11. And we're going to start off by looking at verses 1 through 3. And we see here the text says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Um, there's a few things going on in the first few verses of this passage which are just fascinating. First of all, Paul mentions this idea about him uh, writing to them the same things again. Um, Paul really here probably is talking about this whole idea of rejoicing in the Lord. He is constantly telling them to rejoice in the Lord. Uh, he's also constantly telling them the truth of the scripture. This gives us the idea that this is not the only letter that Paul has written to them. Paul has written to them several letters telling them to rejoice, telling them to be, you know, faithful in their, in their walk in the Lord, and has encouraged them with the true doctrine of scripture. And Paul says that, listen, it's no trouble to him. He loves to do this. He loves to clearly explain the gospel and clearly explain the principles of, of what we have received in Jesus. And so that's what he means there. He's like, listen, it's not a problem for me to tell you these things again because I love to tell you these things. Uh, if you know um, from Paul's other writings and Paul's the other epistles that we have from him, a common theme that Paul writes about is the fact that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works so that no man may boast. That is a constant theme that comes up over and over and over again. And it makes sense that he would be telling the people in the Philippian church uh, these same truths over and over and over again. And so remember in the climate that Paul lived, there were a lot of Jews that were trying to tell the people hey, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a follower of Christ, well, then you need to be circumcised, and you need to follow the Old Testament. You need to follow the law. And Paul was adamantly opposed to that idea. Paul did not believe that you had to abide by the Old Testament scriptures. Um, you still had, you know, there's a morality there that's good that we still abide by even today. But you didn't have to follow the ceremonial law. You didn't have to make sacrifices. You didn't have to be circumcised. You didn't have to do those things. And Paul was adamant about that fact, especially in books like the book of Galatians. And we have a hint of that here from what we see happening in verse 2 and 3. Um, when Paul tells them to look out for the dogs, what's interesting is that that was a very, very popular kind of a slur against Gentiles that the Jews would use during this time period. So they would refer to them as dogs, which is a, a derogatory term. Um, evildoers, that would have been another common thing that you would have heard the Jews call the Gentiles. Um, and so if you're a Jew in the first century listening to Paul or reading this letter or listening to this letter be read, you're tracking along at this point when he says, look out for the dogs. You're like, yeah, all right, look out for those evil Gentiles, horrible people. And then he says, look out for the evildoers. You go, amen, that's right, look out for those evil Gentiles that don't honor and worship our God. All right, and you're rocking right along there with Paul. And then all of a sudden he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And suddenly you're confused. Because one of the biggest things about the Jewish faith and the Jewish community is circumcision. And then Paul says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And this would have been shocking to hear to his Jewish audience as they listened to these things. As Jewish people who were in the faith read these things, this would have utterly shocked them. 
Because what Paul is saying is, yeah, listen, you spent all this time calling the Gentiles dogs. Guess what, Jews? You're the dog. You are the evildoer. You, anyone who goes and mutilates the flesh. And that mutilation of the flesh here is specifically a reference to circumcision. And so Paul is taking the whole paradigm and he's shifting it on its head because the Jewish sentiment of the day was that Gentiles were dirty, unclean, bad people and that you shouldn't associate with them. And what Paul is saying here is that, listen, anyone who wants to try to put circumcision on the same level as grace, anyone who wants to come and say that you have to be circumcised in order to experience grace in Christ, well, guess what? You're the dog. You're the evildoer. And we're not going to accept that because we are the circumcision. It's not the, the cutting off of, of a piece of skin. It's we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ. And we put no confidence in the flesh. Now, a common attack that people would have made against Paul, uh, not necessarily against Paul, but against people in general, if you're not supposed to put confidence in the flesh, well, you only say that because you couldn't earn it yourself. You only say that because you couldn't put any confidence in the work that you've done. And Paul's going to obliterate that argument as he moves on to the next verses. Because Paul is probably one of the most qualified people to boast in his own accomplishment. Um, and we see that looking in verses 4 through 8. Here it says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So understand what Paul's saying here. Paul is saying, listen, all you Judaizers who want to come in and boast of your circumcision, all you Judaizers who want to come in and, and talk about how, how you can boast in your accomplishments and you can boast in the flesh, guess what? I can do more. Because Paul wasn't just, you know, your average Jew. Paul wasn't even just your average Pharisee. Uh, Paul was, was of the right tribe. He was of the right family. He was followed all of the laws, even from early in his life. That's the reference to being circumcised on the eighth day. Um, when he talks about being a Pharisee, other places even talks about how he had the best teachers. Paul was well known among the circle of Pharisees. He was kind of a superstar of their order. And, and he knew the law forwards and backwards, upside down. He knew it every way you can. If there was anyone on the planet who was going to boast in the fact that his adherence to the law, his keeping of the law, his knowledge of the scriptures, his service to Jehovah, all those things. If he is going to be the one who says, yeah, I am, I, I'm, I am just so Jewish and I am so qualified. If anyone's going to say that, it's going to be Paul. And what's Paul's reaction and what's Paul's response to his pedigree and his ability to say these things. He says, whatever gain I had, I counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, look, I look at all my accomplishments. I look at everything I've done. I've looked at everything I've built up. In comparison to knowing Jesus, it's nothing. In comparison to knowing Christ, it is absolutely garbage. Not because of what I did isn't good. I mean, we do service for God all the time. We go to church, we read our Bible, we pray. But we have to understand that if we are going to come to Christ, we have to put all of who we are aside so that we can come to know him because it is in knowing him that we receive eternal life. It's not how many times you've been to church. It's not how many times you read the Bible. It's not how many hours you spend in prayer. It's not how many people you give food to. It's not how many people you help and serve. Although all those things should be a part of your Christian walk, it's not what saves you. It's Christ that saves you. 
and it's knowing Christ that saves you. And Paul elaborates on this uh, in, in the next verse, verses 8 through 11. He says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So this is, this is what Paul is saying here. He's saying, listen, for Christ's sake, I'm going to put all of the other things to side. I'm going to count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, under, please, please understand what Paul is saying here, what he means. He means that as you look at your life and as you look at the things that you've done, you really have a choice to make. You can look at all the works that you've performed, all the good things that you've done. You can look at who you are as a person, the family you raised, the finances you have. You can look at all those things. And, and as we come into the world, the world really depends on those things. The average person in the world outside of Christ, if you ask them about God and their eternality and where they're going to be, they go, well, I've been a good person. And if you say, why have you been a good person? They point to their deeds. They point to their stuff. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And they cling to that. They cling to that as their identity. They cling to that as who they are. They cling to that as the thing that's going to save them and the thing that's going to bring them out of any mess that they find themselves in. And they say, yep, that's what it is. And what Paul says here is he says, I've suffered the loss of those things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Because that's exactly what we have to do. We have to look at those things. We have to look at that, that mountain of work that we've done, the, the identity of who we are, and we have to say, you know what? Just like trash, I'm going to throw it out. Because as long as I'm holding on to those things, I can't hold on to Jesus. As long as I'm relying on those things, I can't rely to Jesus. Paul in his writing says, if you add anything to the gospel, the gospel profits you nothing. And so if you think that your church service is going to save you, you're wrong. You need to count all the work that you've done in that regard as, as just rubbish and garbage. Get rid of it so that you may gain Christ and be found in him. And again, Paul reiterates this fact so clearly. Not having a righteousness of my own, there's nothing you can do to earn it. Not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So, what does this faith in Christ look like? What does righteousness in Christ look like? We have been given probably one of the best word pictures of what it is to put your faith in Jesus that anyone else, that in all, in all the world, it comes from Scripture. In in the book of Numbers, um, the people of God were in the wilderness and they had complained about their situation. And so God sent a bunch of poisonous snakes into the camp to kill them. And as the snakes were going around biting people, people were dying. And so these people came to Moses and they said, Moses, what are we going to do? Like, what, what do we do? Go talk to God, sort this out. And so Moses goes to God and he looks at him and says, God, what should the people do? They're being bitten by these snakes and they're dying. And God could have done a lot of things. God could have said, pray. God could have said, eat this special mixture of herbs as an act of obedience. He could have said things. God gave them the absolute most ridiculous thing in the world to do. God said, I want you to go and I want you to build a snake out of some metal. Melt the metal down, make a snake, and I want you to put it on a pole. And I want you to lift up that pole and I want you to put it in the middle of camp. And then you tell anybody if they get bit by one of the snakes that they need to go look at the pole. And if they look at the pole, then they'll be saved. Now, can you imagine being a parent and bringing your child who's just been bitten by one of these deadly snakes, rushing to Moses saying, what do I do? And he says, have your child look at the pole. And then you're like, can you imagine sitting there with your kid, telling them to look at the pole, angling their face so that they go and they look at this pole and you sit there and think, how long do we have to do this for before we're saved? Is it just a glance? Is it, is it an hour? Like what, what here? Look, look like it's ridiculous and it's absurd. And it goes against every piece of human logic that we have because that's ridiculous. Give me medicine. Give me something to do. But don't just tell me to go look at a pole, a, a snake on, on a pole. That's, that's nonsense. 
And yet Jesus said, just as the snake was lifted up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And see, what we understand is that as in order for us to be saved, in order for us to be found in Christ, in order for us to experience the, the, the power of his resurrection, in order for us to experience and be a part of those things, what do we do? We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus on the cross. We look to our Savior as he dies and bleeds for our sin, and it's the absolute most ridiculous thing in the world. How is it that the death of, of you know, a Jewish man 2,000 years ago makes me right with God? Well, it does so because God said it does. And God has commanded that if we will be forgiven of our sins, that we must place our faith and trust in that man and what he did. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. He says, listen, your logic doesn't matter. What you think gets you right with God doesn't matter. What, what you think you can do to be a good person doesn't matter. You need to cast all those things aside and you need to look to Jesus so that you can be found in him. And because if you're found in him, then you will become like him in his death. And that by any means possible, you may obtain the resurrection from the dead. And that's it. That's what Paul says here. Paul says, listen, I am so Jewish. <laughs> and I am so good as far as the law is concerned. And yet it's all garbage. It's all rubbish. And I trade it all away. And I give it all up for the surpassing, surpassing worth of knowing Christ. And that's how we should be in our walk. That's how we should be in our faith. We should be able to give up everything for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. And, and so long as we're holding on to things of this world and holding on to things we've done, we will never come to know him the way that we're supposed to. And that's salvation. We look to Christ. We preach Christ crucified and raised from the dead. We call upon his name for salvation. And as long as we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths, then we too shall be saved. And that is a beautiful sentiment. Uh, so I uh, love this passage of scripture. It is just so wonderful and so great. I um, hope you've had a wonderful time looking at this piece of text with me this evening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.